Good afternoon, everybody. How's, how are all of you doing? Good. It's good. I'm glad to see you here in church on one of the most sacred holidays in America, Super Bowl Sunday, and you're here. That's awesome. I was driving, I seen everyone in their priestly garments, you know, the 49er uh, clothing jerseys, yes. Uh, no, um, today message will not be about uh, Super Bowl Sunday. You guys can watch that after. Um, but I want to tell you about a time when we went to Israel a few, couple of years ago, and we went to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there is this place called the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Now it's kind of an interesting name, and it just—it's one of the most considered one of the most sacred sites in in the entire uh, world for Christianity. And we actually got to go inside. And the reason why it's so special, because it's believed that Jesus was both crucified and then buried and raised in that nearby location. And we had the privilege of going in there, and it was very awesome. But I, um, I want to actually turn your attention to something uh, outside of this church. If we go to the next slide, if you look, there's this blue box. And, and we, let's go to the next slide. That blue box is actually a photo of this ladder standing over over there. Now, it's kind of interesting, like, why do they have that ladder? What is it for? Right? Well, apparently this ladder has a name. Anybody know the name of this ladder? It is, the, it is called the immovable ladder. Now, uh, the reason why it's called the immovable ladder is because this church, ever since it has been built, essentially, it, it's, uh, it's kind of been contested over who owns this church, right? The, all the different denominations are saying, no, it belongs to us, no, it belongs to us, right? Uh, in fact, it's, it's so divisive that Pope Paul VI, when he came to Jerusalem in 1964, he says that this ladder is a visible s symbol of Christian division. So what happened is the, the different churches kept fighting over this church, so in 1757, when the Muslims were ruling over Jerusalem, the Ottoman Empire, the king or the sultan, uh, Osman III, in 1757 finally said, all right, there's six of you that are claiming to own the church. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put in a royal decree, and we're all going to agree that it all belongs to all of you. It's called the decree of status quo, and that none of you can make a change to this church or to anything in this church, including this ladder, unless all six of you agree. So to this day, there has not been a, an agreement on what to do with this ladder. And therefore, it's been standing there since probably, you know, the 1700s. It can't be moved because all six need to agree and they can't. In fact, there's so much division over kind of the property of this church that in 2002, one of the monks was sitting in a chair and, and he was sitting, and the sun was beaming on him because it's summer, it's hot, you know, Jerusalem. And so he moved the chair over by half a foot to get out of the sun. Well, the other church, whose property was right next to the chair, they saw that as a sign of aggression, and a fist fight actually ensued. And all these monks got into a fist fight, and 11 were hospitalized. <laughs> this is crazy. This is, this is the, the people of God, right? This is not different religion. These are Christians hospitalizing one another. And the reason why I give this as, as funny and sad as it is, this is a sad picture of how we as Christians can slip into disunity, right? We can begin to just divide. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is this idea of unity. And it's been a problem well before this church, of Holy Sepulchre has been built. It's been a problem from the very beginning, from the day the very first person was a Christian. So open your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to give you just, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11, and I'll give you a quick refresher of what we covered in chapter 1. Chapter 1, we see Paul's greeting. He, we see that Paul is rejoicing over the Philippians. He loves them 
They've partnered with him in the gospel. He's praying for them. He shares about how his imprisonment has, has helped advance the gospel. He tells them that he wants to stay and serve them, although he desires to be with Christ. And we see what a Christ-centered life he was living. And then he starts to talk about you know, them receiving the gift of suffering, which sounds so wrong, but that was a sermon from last week. And now he changes the topic to unity. So let's read the first two verses. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So in verse 1, Paul is describing their Christian walk with God, our Christian walk with God, right? Encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, any affection, sympathy. These are all really good things. He says all of these really good things that you already have, He says in verse 2, he says, make sure that your life with God is done together with other Christians in unity. He says, complete my joy. He says, you have all these really good things, right? You've got the encouragement of Christ, the comfort from love. Now, I want you, you're, you're almost there. I want you to take all these good things and I want you to do it with unity, together, with one another. And that, that will complete my joy. That will make my joy full. Proverbs 17, 1 says, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Right? It's saying it's better to be in a house where all you're eating are just dry crackers than to be in a house that's got all the food in the world. And, and, and everyone's celebrating and partying and everything's great, but people are just fighting with one another. They're just yelling at one another. It's better to be in this place of peace where people love one another. Right? It's That's the irony of what's going on with the Philippians. They love God. They are living for God. They have all these good things, and yet they are divided. And the question is, is that really good, right? It it would be like the same thing as, you know, does it really matter if a husband brings his wife flowers every single day if in his heart he's not close to her, right? Does it, do those flowers really matter? And the Philippians, they, they were struggling with unity. We see this come up over and over again. Philippians 1, 27, Philippians 2, Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. We read about two women who are you know, disagreeing in the Lord. And so Paul is begging them to be united. And he gives them specific, he tells them specific poisons that destroy unity. And then he gives them two antidotes to those poisons. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Let's look at the two poisons first. In verse 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. This first word, selfish ambition. It's when we try to gain our own goals, disregarding of what it will cost other people, right? We, we don't think about other people. We don't care about other people. The image that comes to my mind is, you know, somebody cutting in line and just like elbowing people, right? Just, I don't care. I don't care if it hurts. I don't care how long you've been standing here, what you need. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to my own goal, selfish ambition. It's when we crave our own goals and we don't care what it will cost other people when we attain those goals. This selfish ambition, it destroys unity. It's the poison. In fact, God speaks very strongly against selfish ambition. Let's look at James 3.14. Look at the strong words that God gives. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, by the way, that's the same Greek word there, in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Disorder, right? Disorder is the complete opposite of unity. He says selfish ambition, it just destroys unity, decays everything. See, when my goal is not to glorify God, but to attain my own personal goals, I will sacrifice the good of others, the greater good in order to attain that. And that just ends up hurting everyone else. It's like traffic, right? If everyone's just driving calmly in traffic, it's good. That's the greatest good for everyone. But if imagine everybody in traffic starts weaving through traffic. What's going to happen? You're going to get in a bunch of accidents, and then everyone's just going to be standing and waiting. You know, if everyone's running the red light, well, then you can't trust it, and now 
now you're, everyone's driving really slow through the intersection and it, it just doesn't bring good to anybody. Or sports, right? If someone's a ball hog, they don't care what's gonna happen to their team. They just care about their personal stats. And so, and again, it just, it just hurts the greater good. That's selfish ambition. The second poison is conceit. Conceit is when we think of ourselves more than we really are. And that absolutely destroys unity. The Greek word behind this word conceit here, it's, it's kind of a, a fusion of two words, and it literally means empty glory. Empty glory. Conceit is when we think of ourselves and we think that we're great and good above others. Or maybe we're not that obvious in our own minds, and we don't think that, oh, I'm such a great person. But you know what we do? We look down upon other people, right? We look down upon other people, and that is conceit when we think we're better. And nothing destroys unity like when we think we are better than other people. Because when we think we are better than someone else, will we really have a desire in our heart to be united with them? Absolutely not. Right? Why would I want to be united to a person that's beneath me? Right? A person that's worse than me. And, and that's a huge turnoff if you're on the receiving end, right? If, if someone comes in, just the snob, right, and they're looking down upon you, like, dude, I don't want to have anything to do with you. It's okay. Go do your own thing. I, I want nothing to do with you. And that also just completely destroys unity. And also, when we think we're better than other people, we won't listen to people, Right? We're not going to work with people. There's, there's nothing in common. And so Paul, the Holy Spirit, gives us two antidotes to this poison. Read with me verse 3. In humility, the first antidote, in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Now, this one is specifically for the conceit, the poison of conceit, right? Conceit and arrogance destroy unity, but but it is through humility, by counting others more important than ourselves, we can restore unity and we can build unity amongst other people among us. So specifically by counting others more important than ourselves. I remember I heard this great example that Pastor Mike shared in one of his sermons, and it was in the context of married couples, but I think it applies here as well. He says, when a couple is in love with one another and they're close to one another, they speak in very quiet tones. Right, my love, my dear, my beloved. When, when there's some distance, right, they might start to raise their voice. When there's a big distance, they're yelling at one another. Right, the distance isn't physical. The distance is emotional. It's spiritual, and the people feel like they can't hear each other over this distance. So if you're far away, I'm going to have to yell, right, to get your attention. It's very symbolic. Right? Because when we don't feel heard, there is this emotional and this mental distance between us. Same thing happens when we consider people less significant than ourselves in our heart. There's this distance, not physical, emotional, mental. And if we are at a distance, right? if you and I can never be close to one another, then we can't do anything together. Right? If we want to cooperate, if we want to be united, we need to be Shoulder to shoulder, we need to be next to one another. Distance in our hearts towards other people that come from conceit, from looking down upon people, it don't, that distance does not allow us to listen to people, to love people, to serve people, to give to people, and ultimately to unite with people. But the Word of God, church, it calls us to elevate the importance of others in our own minds. Not, 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 not just equal. Think of others as equal as, as yourselves. It says more important. More important. Higher than our own selves. And if you're me, I, I'm thinking, man, that's hard. How? How do we elevate someone as more important than our own selves? Our personal priorities, our goals, our desires, our ambitions, they should be secondary after the people around us. Not theoretically, but actual people. And it should start with our closest relationships that God has placed in our life, right? Our spouse, our parents, our siblings, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our brothers and sisters at church. 
practical application. Who are the people in my life that I look down upon in my mind? Make a list. Just make a list in your mind. I'm not going to ask you to share with your neighbor, okay? But, but, but just make this list. Like, who are those people that you look down upon? Because the Word of God calls us sinful, proud, conceited people to elevate those people in our minds and to make them more significant than our own selves. So, so friends, let's do that this week in our prayers. Let's actively pray about that. Lord, you know I, don't, I look down upon this person. Help me not just elevate to the same level, but more important than myself. Let's pray that this week. The second antidote that we have to the poison is found in verse 4. Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the antidote to selfish ambition, right? To not just look for our own interests, but also to make sure we're considering the interests of other people. Meaning, before you cut in line, so to speak, before you start elbowing people, think about the people that are standing in line. Think about maybe how long they've been in line. Think about maybe the problems that they have, the, the hopes, the dreams, the goals, whatever it is that's going on in their life, the person that they are. Because they are a soul just like us, right? They are made in the image of God just like us. They have dreams and hopes and goals just like us. They are precious in the eyes of God just like us. And so we need to make sure, right, if, if you can take our mind and all the things we think about and kind of plot it on a map, right, if we, we look at this map, we need to make sure that some of the real estate on this map is actually occupied by concerns about other people. Some of the real estate needs to be used in caring for other people's interests and not just 100% my own interests. In fact, the word is essentially challenging us to be ambitious for other people. And notice, it's okay to look out for your own interests. I think the Bible acknowledges like that's normal. I think it's impossible for us not to look out for our own interests, right? Because God made me an individual. God made you, and I live in my own skin. I don't live in your skin. You don't live in my skin. You don't feel my pain physically, I don't feel yours, and it's normal. We're always going to do that. But what the Word of God calls us to do is to extend that bubble of care and concern beyond my own skin. We can't stop there. So a practical application for this is who are the people in my life whose interests that I need to start looking out for? Who are the people? What are those interests? And no, the time that I gave my wife a waffle maker for Christmas because I wanted waffles, that's a bad example, okay? That's, that's not looking out for the interests of others, right? That's, that's just sinful, sneaky, uh, looking out for your own interests. But who are the real people with the real interests? I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Just think about it. Write it down on your phone. Text it to somebody. Text it to yourself. Whatever it is. Who is that person or those people and what are those interests? Because, friends, if we do not apply the word of God, what are we doing? What are we doing here? Right? James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not only hearers, deceiving yourselves. If we just sit here and we listen and we just get convicted and we just stop at that, but nothing ever changes once we leave this building other than a change here. And the, but this change is important, but the change also always needs to manifest itself through our actions. And if we leave here and we don't actually look out for the interests of others, then we, the Word of God says, have deceived ourselves. We deceived ourselves. Now, some of you might be sitting here and you might be encouraged. Others of you might be convicted, and yet I'm sure there are some that are frustrated. Because maybe for you, like for me often, 
you've found that you've already tried this, right? I've been there, I've done that, I, I, I've tried it and I've, I've failed. I just keep failing. I'm too selfish. Now let's be honest. Let's be honest. It's difficult, right? It's difficult to, to care about other people, to humble ourselves, to elevate other people in our minds. It sounds good in theory, but it feels impossible in real life. And if you are discouraged, if you're frustrated, I want to tell you there's a key that the Word of God gives us. Imagine you're on a road trip to Yellowstone National Park, right? It's far away, and you're driving there, and all of a sudden, you lose reception, you take a wrong turn, you get lost, and you're driving around, driving around, and then you run out of gas. And you're like, am I going to die? Is the grizzly bear going to come and eat me, right? And then all of a sudden, this old pickup truck pulls up. You know, it's this friendly, nice local guy. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'll give you a map. And he draws you the map and everything. He's like, this is great. And he's about to leave. You're like, whoa, hold on, hold on. I still can't get there. I know how to get there. I just don't have any gas, right? And oftentimes, we know the right thing to do, right? We know how to get there, but we just don't have the fuel to actually get there. In the Word of God, verses 3 and 4, is that's the map. God is telling us how to get there, what to do. In verses 6 through 11, he gives us the fuel, the gasoline, in order for us to actually get there. Or to put this another way, behavior is what? It's caught, not taught. Right? You can, if you show your kids one thing and you tell them to do something else, they're going to do what you're doing, right? Not what you're telling them to do. In fact, it's because God has designed us this way. Neuroscientists discovered, if we could go to the next slide, that we have a type of neurons in our brain called mirror neurons. And what they found is whenever a person, whenever we watch someone do something, there's a certain category of neurons that will fire the same exact way as the neurons that are firing in the brain of another person. It's the same pattern as if we were actually doing it. God has designed us this way to learn to grow, right? And it's beautiful. It's amazing. That's why it's so powerful to see an example, right? It's one thing to say, oh, this is how you fish. And you read a, a, you know, a six-step process of how to fish. Or, or you just have someone actually show you, right? And hold your hand. Way better. And this is what happens. Oftentimes we know what we need to do, but we lack the example. But God does not leave us hanging. That's why verse 5 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Meaning, think this way, consider others more important, seek the interests of others, because this way of thinking, this way of life, it's ours. It already belongs to us. We already have possession of it, but it's found in a very specific place. More specifically, it's found in a person. Jesus Christ. We have that way of thinking. We have that way of living in Christ. Not apart from Christ. Not our own. But specifically in Jesus. Because Jesus has provided us the greatest example. And Jesus now gives us the Holy Spirit. Who helps us imitate him. Right? Of considering others more important. Of seeking the interests of others. Let's look at Christ's humiliation. Verse 6. Read with me. Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Meaning he was and is God, in the form of God, the highest possible being. There is no one greater, there is no one higher, no one even comes as a close second to God. He is the infinitely worthy one, church. That's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ. And notice this. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Meaning he didn't try to cling to his status and his position of being God. He says, no, I'm in the form of God and you can't take that away from me. These are my rights. Jesus didn't do that. This belongs to me. This is who I am. Jesus instead He opened up his hands and he gave up all his privileges, his highest privileges. It's easy, right, to theoretically give something that we don't own, 
right? If I had a million bucks, oh, I'd donate it to church for sure. I'd give it to God, right? Or at least half, right? I'd do that, right? It's easy to give things we don't have. But it's really hard to give something that we have, something we're used to, something we've lived with our whole life. Well, that's really hard, and that's really difficult. Jesus always was in the form of God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He always enjoyed the privilege of being God, and he gave it up. Notice, he didn't try to cling to it. Why do we cling to positions or privileges? Oftentimes, it's because we're insecure, right? But Jesus was so secure in him knowing who he was, being God. He didn't try to hold on to it. But when we live with this conceit, this empty glory, and this insecurity, we have a hard time letting go, do we not? Because we feel like maybe if I let this go, then I'll lose everything I've ever had. I had this little thing, and I don't want to let it go. Jesus didn't live that way. Verse 7, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He was in the form of God, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Not that he stopped being God. That's not what Paul is teaching here. But he's saying that he humbled himself. And the specific way of humbling himself is by becoming a human and taking the form of a servant. God, as we've already said, he is the greatest possible being, right? The highest, the most wonderful, the most glorious and, and if you get the most wonderful, just awe-inspiring angel that can kill everybody on earth with his sword in just one second, right? You get that most powerful angel of God. And if you compare him with God, with Jesus Christ, the distance between him and God will be greater than the distance between the ugliest, dirtiest worm and that angel. The angel and the worm have more in common than the greatest angel has in common with the almighty God. Because God is so much greater, because God is infinite, he is not created, he is in a category of his own infinitely. That's our God. And Jesus was in that form, and yet he goes from being in the form of God to becoming a slave, servant. That's what the Greek says. He took the lowest position in society. He had no rights, no privileges, nobody cared about him. They were just property. He goes from being at the center of the universe, holding it all together. He continued to hold it all together. But he moved to the outskirts of the orbit of all creation. The infinite took on the finite. The spirit becoming flesh. Power taking on weakness, limitlessness taking on limitations. I'll give, you, I'll give you an analogy. We all enjoy, we all, we all walked into here, right? Most of us. We walked into here. We're going to walk out of here. We enjoy being healthy. We enjoy being mobile, moving around. Now imagine there was someone in your life, some loved one, that was going to die unless you did this surgery, some transplant, But the only catch was that this transplant, after this transplant, you would be paralyzed from neck down. And you would be bedridden for the rest of your life. Would you do it? Would you limit yourself in that way for the rest of your life? that's, That's hard, right? Bedridden? Can't move at all? can't talk, can't do anything. And yet, God, Jesus Christ, limited himself far more than just becoming bedridden for the rest of our earthly life. The degree to which God limited himself was infinitely greater by him taking on human form and becoming a slave. The depth of that sacrifice, we cannot even come close to that sacrifice. Even if we were to become paralyzed from neck down for the rest of our lives, that is nothing in comparison to the sacrifice of Jesus. We will never, we will never, friends, we will never fully grasp all that he gave up to become like us. 
Never. So, continuing, verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, his humiliation did not end with him just appearing on earth and being limited the way he was. That's not where it ends. The one who was directing the universe from day one has now become submissive. He has bowed his head. He has become obedient. And his obedience did not stop at the point of inconvenience. Right? Isn't that where our obedience stops often? My obedience, right? That's where I see. That's, that's my limit of obedience. As soon as things get a little bit inconvenient, well then, you know what? I think I'm free from being obedient. I'm no longer obligated to be obedient. We're fine living for God, obeying God, serving God, as long as it doesn't cost me anything, as long as it fits well with my schedule and my priorities and my budget. But as soon as there's even a hint of inconvenience, well, then all of a sudden it just becomes all optional, right? I'm, I'm talking about myself right now, friends. I see this in my heart first and foremost. But Jesus, he didn't stop at the point of inconvenience. He didn't even stop at the point of pain. I think w- most of us are so stuck at being convenient, uh, uh, obedient only to the point of convenience that we don't even have any clue of what it means to obey God in the midst of pain. But do you know that that's what God expects from us? Hebrews 12, 4 says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The Bible says that it is better to shed our own blood than to give in to sin. The Bible says it is better to bleed than to disobey We're so pampered, and we don't have a clue. And yet Jesus was obedient to the point of death, meaning complete and perfect obedience, complete submission and humility. And it wasn't just an easy death. It wasn't just a quick death, right? Like today's executionary methods try to make execution as humane as possible, as as painless as possible. The cross was the complete opposite of that. The cross was a tool that was engineered to inflict as much suffering as possible in a cheap way, right? If we kill him too fast, everyone else doesn't learn the lesson. If we kill him too slow, it's going to take too much time, too much money. It needs to be cheap. It needs to be easy. And it needs to be as painful as possible for as long as possible. That's what the point of the cross was. To teach everybody a lesson. And the Romans, they perfected the art of crucifixion. And Christ was obedient till the very end on the cross. So going back, verses 3 and 4. Count others more significant than yourselves. Seek the interests of others. We have to remember that Christ's selfless sacrifice... It wasn't for himself. He did it for us. He did it for me, Peter. He did it for you so that we can find forgiveness, so that we can have eternal life. That's why Jesus did that, so that our sins can be paid for, to give us hope and peace with God. Don't get me wrong. Obedience is important, but we're not saved through obedience. Obedience is not what gives us favor before God. No. Jesus did all the hard and the dirty work. And then we just come in at the very end and we collect his paycheck. We get the payment. We get the reward. Friends, this is insanity if you think about it. If you really think about what the gospel is, it's so not fair at all. Because his perfect obedience to the point of death on a cross now becomes my righteousness before God. His painful death becomes my eternal life. Yes. This is literally the gospel. The good news of God. And it is ridiculously not fair. It's the craziest form 
of generosity and selflessness. And if you trust in Jesus, you too can accept his work on your behalf. You too can stand before the Father complete and pure and washed of all your sins because Jesus was obedient on your behalf. And we're not stealing that from him. No, he's offering it to all of us freely. He says, come to me. You thirst, come to me and drink and I will give you and you will never thirst again. That's why he came, to seek and to save the lost. And now, 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 now that we have trusted in him, that we have been transformed by faith and grace, Now we can look upon his great generosity as he considered us more important, as he looked for our interests and not only his. And now we not only know where to go, but we have the strength to get there because we have the ultimate example of love and sacrifice. And we're on the receiving end of that love and that sacrifice And that's why the Spirit tells us, verse 5, which is yours, it's yours. It belongs to you in Christ Jesus. You already have this mind. So looking to Jesus, we can count others more important. Even if those people are not as good as we are, quote unquote, they're not as smart, they're not as whatever it is that we think, why we think we're better than them as we are, whatever that reason is, because we are infinitely inferior to Jesus. And he didn't use that excuse to stay up there in heaven. But he still came down and died for us on the cross. Looking to Jesus, we can look not only to our own interests, but the interests of the other people in our life, the real human beings in our life. Because if Jesus did all of that for me, then why can I not do something infinitely smaller? For others. Maybe it's when you can't find the strength, friends, to love people, to consider them more important, to seek their interests, have the mind of Christ. It's yours. You already have it. It's in Jesus. And remember what he has already done for you personally. That's the secret. That's the fuel. That's what gets us there. As I call the band up, I want to close on this last point. And you see, as humbling and as encouraging as it is to think about the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, the example of just selflessness which builds that unity, God throws in another very, very pleasant surprise. Read with me verses 9 through 11, the last three verses. It says... And then there's this word, therefore. And it's important because it means whatever we just talked about, on the basis of this, this is true, right? So on the basis of Christ's humiliation, verse 9, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As a result of his sacrifice and his humility, God has highly exalted Jesus. Jesus went from being found in the form of God, taking human form, form of servant, obedient, obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. He, He humbled himself all the way down there. And therefore... God took him and exalted him. He went from being at the top to the bottom, back to the top. And now, on the last day, every knee will bow before Jesus, meaning he, everyone will confess that he is Lord, that he is master, he is king, he is the boss, he is the all in all, and all will submit to him one day. And herein lies this great mystery, friends, that humility is the path to true greatness. And we see it all over the Bible. It's everywhere. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, 
So that, meaning why should we humble ourselves? So that, and he gives us the reason why we should. So that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Look at that. We're not humbled for the sake of just staying humble for all of eternity. No, we are humbled so that at the proper time, not we, but he will exalt us. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and then what? And he will exalt you. Matthew 23, 12, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the great mystery of God, that humility is the true path to exaltation. Exaltation is a good thing if it's God who's exalting us and not ourselves. Proverbs 29, 23, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. We're never, it's, it's never humility for the sake of being humble and that's it. There's always an end goal to this humility. True humility, not fake humility, true humility always leads to a lifting up. And that lifting up, I would say 99% of that lifting up probably occurs in eternity, but that's, what, that's where it really matters, amen? That's where it matters, and God is bringing us there. Jesus followed that path, and we are called to follow that path as well. This is the irony of this sinful world, right? That if you want true riches, you got to lose them here. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to the rich man, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. You want comfort? Give up the hope of comfort in this world. You want true greatness? Become insignificant here. You want true life? Lose it here. And Jesus says, take up your cross every day. Die to yourself every day and you will have eternal life. When we look for the interests of others, God will look to our interests, both here on earth and ultimately in eternity forever and ever. When we put others higher than ourselves in our minds, God will exalt us, not just in our minds, but in reality. Friends, let us pursue unity with one another. Let us do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, let us count one another as more important than ourselves, looking not only to our own interests, but the interests of others with Christ as our ultimate example and our teacher. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand. We'll give you a minute of response time. Who are the people that God is calling you to seek their interests? What specifically can you do this week? Who are the people that maybe we look down upon and that that needs to be repented of and brought before the Lord? Bring it to God. Look to Christ. Lord, we come before you and we worship you for all that you've done. We thank you for giving us eternal life through your perfect obedience and obedience we can never have. Thank you. May we live for you, God, specifically by seeking the interests of other people, God, by considering others more important than ourselves. Help me, Lord. You know, this is, this is difficult. This is hard for me, Lord. But help us. Be with us. I pray for anyone who hasn't trusted in you yet, who hasn't come to know your freedom, your grace. I pray they would come to know you, trust in you, and run after you. Bless us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.